Okay, we're ready to go. Um, well, today uh, on Pittsburgh Artist Studio, I have a uh, pretty famous, to me at least, uh, blues guy, and uh, he's from Canada, and you may already have met him uh, through his music. His name is David Gogo. So welcome, David. I'm glad you could stop into my video. Good to see you. Yeah, nice seeing you too. Um, well, I have a few questions for you, and I wanted to see if you could uh, just elaborate on some of these, and I guess we'll get started. So uh, what first got you into music, David? <clears throat> you know, I just, my, my parents didn't play music, but my dad played a lot of loud music at home, you know, the vinyl albums, but uh, yeah, everything from CCR and Hank Williams, but uh, there was some blues in there. There was BB B. King and Can Heat. And it just, I always just, I just like music, you know, and it, when I first saw Elvis on TV and he was still alive, <laughs> but um, yeah. it, that just, it, it just, that's what I wanted to do. I can't think of a time where I didn't either have a, a toy guitar or, you know, a little ukulele to jump around with. So it's just always been, been in me. That's interesting. So do you think you, you started at a pretty young age then to really get into the playing diff, the inter instruments? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, like when I was, Oh, you know, five, six years old. That's you know, oh wow. I, I, yeah, I, I was bugging my parents for a guitar. I was actually physically too small. I remember, you know, going to the music store, and putting a guitar on my lap, and it was up to here. You know, I couldn't see it. Right <laughs> yeah, right. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's just all cool. what I meant to do. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. So, um, well, tell me a little bit about your creative process. Well, um, you know, this pandemic times has certainly. Uh, <laughs> given me time to finally, you know, write, get, get, afford to be the, the luxury to be home and, and write all the time. Um, when you're a touring musician, it, it's, it can be difficult because you spend so much time in airports and rental cars going up and down highways and gigging. By the time you get home, you can be pretty exhausted. So mm -hmm. the pandemic time has given me a chance just to kind of um, get those guitars off the wall and, and um, you know, inspiration you can, can be found anywhere. And we were complaining about technology earlier earlier when I was having a hard time getting on the stream. But the, the cool thing about having an iPhone and things like that now is you can jot down a couple lyrics on your notes or you can sing a little part. Or if you're in the hotel room, just the guitar, you can play a part. So, you know, when I, when I was traveling on the road all the time, I'd get back home and just kind of go over all these little bits and pieces and um, mm -hmm. try to make some kind of a cohesive unit out of it. And songwriting is something that i just enjoy more and more as the years go by when i first when it's time for my first album in like 92 or something it didn't really interest me the like the, the whole recording process and songwriting i just wanted to get out and play live and now I, I'm, I'm much more into the the, the process of, of, of creating uh new songs and making yeah. new albums that's cool yeah I, that's one of the questions i kind of wanted to ask what what comes first like the, is it the lyrics or is it the words i mean the words or the music so i guess you kind of answered that you kind of jot it down and then go from there yeah well sometimes you know I'll, I'll pick up a guitar i haven't played in a while and there's lots of guitars around my house and just that instrument will inspire you you just find a little pattern, a chord pattern or a riff or something and say, oh, that's kind of fun. Let's go. And then I'll go to my notebook where I've, you know, jotted down a couple lines. So it's it. I don't really start with with one or the other. It, it all depends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Uh, so, well, um, so you how I mean, I guess with COVID, you've been trying to get things together, maybe writing some more uh, or, or you haven't been performing, no doubt, or, or have you? I've done a few live stream things mm -hmm. um, up here in Vancouver Island. We just got shut down again yesterday until April 19th. Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, I was, supposed, I was supposed to actually play a couple of shows in front, of, in front of an audience in November. And two days before the gigs, we had two of them and they were sold out, you know, limited capacity. But we were excited just to play. And, yeah. and uh, they did the same thing. They pulled the plug two days before. So um coming up in april i've got um another solo live stream concert i'm doing online from a theater uh, mm -hmm. about an hour and a half from where i live and then one of the festivals in on vancouver island the victoria jazz society they put on a jazz festival and a blues bash every summer and they, they've had to postpone it once again so um, what, well, yeah oh it's unreal so but what they're doing um instead is we're going to go down and, and just set up in a, in a in a venue an empty venue and they're mm -hmm. going to film us playing 
and then they're oh, going to broadcast cool. it when, when like this summer when the festival's supposed to be which it's great that they're doing something but it's just i've done a couple of those playing to an empty room and it's it's, it's weird. not the same <laughs> yeah it's just not the same yeah i know well with steve too we lost a lot and the band actually broke up so it, the COVID's really caused a lot you know well, um, what I'm worried about is is the venues. Like when it, when, you know, when we're yeah. allowed to actually go out there and play, and, and I'm, I'm going to be recording a new album in June. Hopefully, get it out in the fall. You know, hopefully there'll be places to play still because that that's the toughest part. Well, that's true. A lot of places are closing. Uh, they've done that around here. Well, I told you about the Rex that closed, and um, there's a couple of places in in downtown Pittsburgh that closed that they would play at. So. I don't think that a lot of these places want to pay either, you know, with this situation because they're running so so low on funds not being open. Well, yeah, and you know, I I really feel for the staff, you know, the bar staff, the, the mm. owners, the the technical people, like sound, sound people, light people. You know, I can still like last summer, I would just do private backyard socially distanced things, just solo. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, it was enough to, to pay the bills. But if you're a sound man or a light man, you can't say to someone, hey, I'll go set up my lights in your backyard, you know, and yeah, right. people. Uh, that right. just doesn't work. So yeah. and, and keeping that in mind, that's like I, I mentioned, I'm thinking of recording. Well, we are. We're going to record a new album in June just in my house. So same thing, mm -hmm. like low budget uh, in, in the house, but more acoustic based, because I think when things finally do open up, they're going to be at a much smaller scale. And it'll yeah. be difficult for me to bring my whole band out. I think a lot of it will just be the solo or perhaps a duo at first until they can get mm -hmm. the capacity up there. Yeah, it, yeah, it's going to be tough. So, well, let me ask you a little bit about your uh, latest album, The uh, 17 Vultures. I listened to that the other day. It's so good. Uh, we don't get the albums here in, in the United States. It's all MP3s or whatever they are, MP4s. But uh, I just wanted to know about uh, if that was, if any of that, those lyrics were a part of your life. Like, did you write from experiences or um, you just kind of came up with those? Um, so, some of it. Let me just look on my computer. I'll go see what songs. Uh, I'll, I'll think about it. Well, well my, my, my favorite song on there is the last song. It's called um, Shake My Head. Mm -hmm. And that was written, we've, we've had a real problem up here in the West Coast of Canada uh, with um, addiction and homelessness. Um, mm. it's like the whole fentanyl thing, it's just, it's, it's just brutal. It's like they're breaking records of how many people are dying. Oh, wow. And unfortunately, I've known a few. Mm. So that song is, is, is based on that. But it was difficult to write because I didn't want to be judgy you know i didn't want to be judgmental about people that have problems with them. i mean i've got my own uh, yeah. demons you know um, <laughs> <We all do. laughs> but, 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 but you know but people are, are dropping dead and um yeah. so it was it was i probably spent more time writing and, and rewriting and rearranging that song than anything i've ever done uh mm -hmm. before and it was an interesting process you know i just go in, in my back room and do a demo of the song and then i listened to it go no 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 that's wrong and i, I ended up you know making the the chorus the intro and like just switching everything it, i really really spent a lot of time on it so i'm pretty proud of that one yeah um, that's good. Mm -hmm. there's another song called too good to be true that's just about kind of getting getting older and, and still being single <laughs> 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 and it's just you know, yeah unfortunately getting older it just doesn't stop <laughs> yeah but it's, it's kind of like, you know, like, like trying to go and, and go on a date or something. And, and that's, yeah. you know, you, you meet some, some, some girl and you're like, wow, she's, she's really quite good looking and seems really cool. How come she's available? And well, you soon find out. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't have that issue right now, but <laughs> I don't think I'd even start to date if anything went wrong. There's too um, much, too much crazy stuff going on these days. Oh yeah. Yeah, um, so. else? Oh, Sulfite Boogie. I had my friends in, in a band called Monkey Junk. They, they, they backed me up on this one. They were in, oh, yeah. in, the, yeah, in Nanaimo. They were on tour because they're from Ontario. So it's a long yeah. way away. They were on tour and uh, I just happened to be recording. And I, so I asked if they would come in and they did. They just, you know, they, they did a show in Nanaimo on the Friday or whatever it was. And they had to play it down in Victoria on this Saturday night. But we got in there in the morning in the studio and I already had the demo of the song set up and uh, 
So that was cool. And it was kind of based on, it, it's, a, it's, it's a song about drinking and being hung over. <laughs> but, <don't> <laughs> Yeah, well, it was, it was based on, on kind of a, the, the, the germ of the idea was I actually had a dinner at my house with Steve Mariner from Monkey Junk and mm -hmm. another guy, uh, Sean Hall from a band called The Harpoonist and the Axe Murder up here. And oh, wow. we we all had things to do early in the morning. We all had to hit the road. I think I had to catch a plane. Sean had to catch a ferry and, and Steve had to catch a different ferry. So we all had to get up at like 5 30 in the morning and, and and so we were we were texting each other the next day going why 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 did we do this to ourselves so anyways it's that's kind of based it's it's a fun song it's silly but yeah. it's it's cool yeah and think, 17 vultures the, the title track that was i was on a back back of a fishing boat way way up on this remote part of vancouver island in the west coast a little town called tassis and I do a show up there every year, a solo show. And what I do is, um, I mean, it's it's in the middle of nowhere. But I swap, I do an acoustic show. And instead of being paid cash or whatever, I, I do it for a chartered fishing trip. So we go way up on the high seas and go fishing for salmon and halibut. But it takes you about an hour to get from the village of Tassis through these fjords and everything. And it's just desolate. So it was it was a beautiful morning. But I just started thinking about life and thinking about things. And once again, got out the old phone and started dictating these lyrics. And um, mm. yeah, I got about, I think, three verses written on the way out and the last one written on the way in. So, yeah. and, and then when I was going home the next day, I actually saw this weird tree on the way up to my house. It was a, a barren kind of big dead snag tree. And there was actually 17 great big turkey vultures in this tree. Oh, my. Yeah. So, and the, and the lyrics are kind of just pondering life and death, and you know, as you get older and you lose friends and and people that you know that mm -hmm. close to you, and and just seeing those vultures kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> it, it will be your day soon. Like, oh yeah, I know, I know. I get, I think a lot about that myself. So. Yeah. Well, I'm getting, it's, it's I'm getting old, just start doing that. Yeah. The, the 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 opening song. Thanks for the distraction. That was written I, I was texting with a girl uh, and she was at some conference somewhere and you know so we were kind of you know doing the, the flirting text thing and then she says okay um you know my meeting's about to come to an end and i gotta go and you know hear the summation or whatever she was thanks for the distraction and I went, oh that's kind of neat Ooh, so i just yeah. wrote that down and yeah. yeah yeah sometimes those things pop in your head i guess i i don't write music i can't do that you know but um I think some it's such a talent to be able to come up with that, you know, those lyrics and then the actual music to it, you know. But I yeah. I really enjoyed that album. It's very good. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah, and this I think most of them I wrote on my own. Um, I've collaborated in the past. I got a friend who lives on a uh, uh, place called Gabriel Island. It's like a twenty minute ferry ride from Nanaimo, and um, he lived down in Nashville for a while, and he's he's he, we, we seem to collaborate well together. So mm -hmm. um, for the new record, we've got one that we already kind of came up with together and we're going to uh, probably do another one. Cause I've, the other thing I've been doing recently is on, cause my family history where, where I'm talking to you from right now on our family property, my great grandfather bought this place in 1897. Oh wow. So, yeah. I mean the, the initial packages, it was, it was probably about a thousand acres. So between my mm -hmm. dad and his brothers, they bought it from their parents. So, I've got a lot of history here, but on the other side of the coin, on my mother's side of the family, I have what's called Métis heritage, which mm -hmm. is indigenous. It's um, ba basically French settlers coming into Canada and um, getting together with uh, the Cree. And um, so I've been reading, I, you know, luckily there's, uh, there's no real history on my dad's side, but on my mom's side there is because a couple of um, her great, great, great uncles uh, were some of the first Indigenous people in Canadian politics and ele elected mm -hmm. and uh, hung out with Louis Riel and stuff. So that's something I'm exploring right now, too, is just, the, the, you know, where do we come from? Yeah, that's always interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't find too much on my family. <laughs> I tried, you know, I did find on my mom's side, but I can't find on my dad, my dad's side. I don't know what happened there. They were from Germany. So, right. it, it, yeah, it gets a little hard to find some of that way back when so well let's can we move on to the next question or 
are we finished sure. with your album there? Or? <clears throat> okay, that's good. I mean, I, I really enjoyed that album and it's always nice to hear the history too. So, um, so throughout the years, uh, who has been your favorite person to perform with? Oh, I've, you know, I've been so fortunate over my career and, um, that kind of inspired me to start my podcast, the Soul Bender podcast, because yeah. when what I do, because Canada is such a huge country, uh, but not a lot of population. So the only way it makes sense for me to tour when I'm doing my band shows is if I, I have one band in the western part of Canada. I have another band in Ontario to kind of cover the central. And mm -hmm. um, recently I started hiring um, a couple of players in the prairies just because I was getting some shows there and it just financially made more sense for me to fly in and work with people there. But as I, you know, this, this gives you new stories in the van. It's not like the same four people all the time. Yeah. But when I started working with people younger than me and I'd mentioned, you know, hanging out with someone like Stevie Ray Vaughan or playing yeah. on stage with Albert Collins or Johnny Winter or BB King or Otis Rush, they were just like, what you, they were kind of amazed and I realized, yeah, I guess I've been doing this for a while. So I decided to do this podcast and just talk about those experiences. Um, the, you know, obviously BB King, to get a chance to play with BB King was something special. I mean, he's, he's just mm -hmm. one of the greatest ever, but the guy that, and I love Johnny Winter because I got to spend a lot of time with him. I probably did 40 shows with Johnny Winter over the years mm -hmm. and really got to know him and, and played on stage with him as well. But the guy that I miss the most is Albert Collins. Oh um, yeah. yeah. Did you ever see him? Well, I've heard his albums. No, I never saw him, though. Yeah. yeah. The master of the Telecaster. So he yeah. was the most powerful guitar player I've ever heard. And just a really nice guy. It was really encouraging to me. And this is like, I was young. This is like when I'm 19, 20 years old. And he'd get yeah. me up to play. Like, I'd open the shows and he'd get me up to play. Even if I just showed up to go see him, he'd, he'd say, you know, you got to set in tonight, son. And I was just so excited, That's you know, cool. to play with him. He was so generous. Yeah. So Nice. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that is really neat. You know, I, I well, Johnny Winter, we saw him at the Rex with you, and um, yeah, he amazed me. And I was really upset when he passed away. Uh, and I always, um, one of my first albums as a teenager was Edgar Winter, so I mean, Frankenstein album. So I mean, I've been like involved in that myself, you know, for years. So. Kind of neat. Yeah, yeah I had a good, a good experience because the last tour I did with Johnny, I think it was 13 shows um, starting the West Coast of Canada, going as far as Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of hang, like hang time, you know, wait, waiting, uh, you know, to play some theater, do a sound check. And they go, well, guys, we're having a little bit, a bit of a problem. It's probably going to be another 45 minutes or an hour. Well, that's another 45 minutes or an hour that I go hang out with Johnny Winter and his Winnebago and, you know, just asking him questions about yeah. what it was like to produce Muddy Waters albums for him what it was like mm -hmm. to you know play with Dwayne Ullman you know like oh, yeah Ullman. wow yeah 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 that would be cool that would be neat too just hearing all that yeah, yeah so. I did. and he's a, he's a guy I miss because we were supposed to play a festival with him um I think he passed away a week before it was a festival oh. in, in in Quebec and I was really looking forward to seeing him because I hadn't seen him in about a year yeah oh yeah yeah, so yeah, but, but, but we, we did a couple of tributes for him. We, we did a tribute at that festival, and then uh, Paul Nelson came up with the Johnny Winter Band and to a little place called Gravenhurst, Ontario, and, and we did another tribute there. So that was mm -hmm. nice. Cool, yeah. Yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. I, th I hate to hear these people going, you know, a lot of these great blues people especially, you know. They just uh, seem to be, well, at least uh, we have a few still left, which is good, you know, so. Well, tell us what's next for David. Go, go. Well, just um, I'm considering writing a book, to, you know, just to see, yeah, to see how long this pandemic goes on. But like I said, I, I started this this podcast talking about all the people I've, I've met. And so I might kind of, you know, go through those memories and, and just do like like a memoir of, of all the mm -hmm. things I've done in my career. I've been doing it for 30 plus years now. And like I say, I, I was fortunate to... Um, a lot of the times be in the right place at the right time and meet these these legends and a lot of them are gone so why not yeah. tell tell the stories that i have of those people and the other thing is just it's like um i'm having to sort through all these songs that i've been working on the last year i was lucky enough well a year ago march uh to get a little bit of money from uh the government as an arts grant to write Ooh. 
And, and that really made me feel better because it was kind of a kick in the pants. Last year was supposed to be my most successful year ever in terms of touring and everything. And I remember in January looking at my day timer and looking at all the gigs we had booked and I was just excited, like, wow, this yeah. is so excellent, you know? Yeah. And then the whole thing was just up and fell apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that, that, that really bummed me out so much. And, and yeah. you know, it was a thing that could have knocked a guy into depression or something, except that I applied for this grant and, and it wasn't a huge amount of money, but it was enough that went, it gave me, made me feel valid. Like, okay, I have to write these songs because they, they're paying me to do that. And, right. and so that's going to turn into an album. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I know this pandemic. Uh, oh. Did you get your vaccine yet? Are you able to get that? Well, I, I, my mother just got her first shot, and I think I'm going to get mine soon. It, well, I, I guess I said I talked about this Métis heritage. I got my Métis card. Well, apparently the, the, the Indigenous people get it sooner than the others, so oh. fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I might get it in a month or something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah, yeah. That's, I think once everybody gets that, we'll be okay, but it's going to take a while, I feel. Yeah, and, and we get some kooky people up here and i'm sure you've got kooky people oh yeah oh yeah all the hoax and the whole nine yards oh and, yeah and and some people are just getting too comfortable with it you know like like yeah. british columbia especially vancouver island had really low numbers for a long time but now that all of a sudden the ski season happened you know like they got famous ski hills whistler and that well people are coming from all over the place and all of a sudden the numbers shot through the roof and uh, we didn't i think we should have just shut shut even provincial borders down and, yeah. and, and, pe and people after a while just get complacent and they just, you know. Well, that's how it is here. Our numbers have increased here too. So, uh, but I did get my first shot. So. Oh, <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen when I get my second one. They say you get pretty sick. So we'll yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. I don't know anyone that's had both, but uh, yeah, my mom just got hers on Sunday. So yeah. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. Well, David, I guess uh, we can wrap this up. It was really great talking with you. I haven't seen you for a while, so it's been a yeah. long time, actually. <laughs> yeah, so um, it was nice chatting. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. No All right. We'll see you. Bye.